I didn't know until recently that there are over a thousand stone circles in England. It's literally littered with like ancient megalithic, neolithic sites. I was invited down today to join Ben and Hugh from Megalithomania on their tour of the Avebury stone circles. Well, first off, Avebury is huge. It, it is one of the biggest, I think it is the biggest henge megalithic neolithic stone circle in england look at it huge and one of the cool things is that unlike stonehenge you can actually go up right up close and touch the henge be part of it walk around it's completely free to visit as well so at the moment avery is um it's winning <laughs> yeah do we know where these came from? Yep. Can you see that far horizon yeah. line over there? Yeah. That's called these the Valley of the Stones. Oh, so they didn't drag them far. You can uh, see oh, there. that's another <laughs> seven miles over. Oh, right, okay. There. You're the one dragging them. Like I mean, that's far. absolutely huge. <gasps> that is huge. It does feel like a giant. Okay, so what is the difference between Stonehenge and Avebury? Well, they're quite close together. They're only 20 miles apart and Stonehenge is made of around 50 stones and Avebury is nearly twice the size of that at around 100 stones. Avery is officially dated around 800 years older than Stonehenge, uh, with carbon dating coming in at around 3000 BC to 2000 BC, and it was in a similar way to Stonehenge, made in stages, so lots of different generations, adding bits, moving bits, repackaging the site, if you know what I mean. I think the difference between Stonehenge though and Avery is it's now believed by uh... Parker Pearson and the archaeologists, uh, Stonehenge stones never saw the light of day. They were buried and brought out through the surface to make it easier to dress. So I like that idea that they're sleeping in the ground, they're in the womb of Gaia, and then they come up to make Stonehenge. These were lying on the surface, therefore they've got a hard crust. So if you're going to pound them, you're going to have more work doing that to stone the crust on. Now, there is a huge ditch that goes all the way around. Literally the current village of Avebury is inside the huge circumference of, of this henge. Excavations of the surrounding ditch show that its creation involved digging away nearly 200,000 tonnes of earth and rock and debris. That is a hell of a lot of earth to be moving, especially if you've only got little tiny stone tools. I mean, that's gonna take you a minute. And there are indications that the ditch may have originally been filled with water. So this ditch is no no tiny little ditch. This thing is very deep. It is at least eight to 10 meters deep. And the water table is looking like it was at least two meters high. So the stone circle in the middle would have literally like, like, like a moat going around with a little island of like sacred stones. It would have looked amazing. Quick little history about the village. Obviously this is a relatively recent addition to the site. It was first mentioned as Averia in 1180 and then Avebury in 1386 and the name Avebury first appeared in 1689. But today many people still pronounce the name Avebury. Now this is interesting. A Dr. Stukely spent 30 years visiting, recording, measuring, drawing, and chronicling the great stones of Avery and the surrounding landscape. And he believed that the central rings represented a serpent within a circle whose head and tail were represented by two avenues of sarsen stones extending more than a mile into the countryside. Now this is extremely interesting because there are many other ancient sites in the world that have a serpent theme of iconography um like serpent mound in america very interesting that on opposite sides of the world uh, around the same time um everyone was trying to represent serpents they are like a massive part of ancient imagery i wonder why what was the serpent representing and why was everyone obsessed with snakes that is was there's a, a, a guy spent like 30 years researching this and measuring it he basically reverse engineered the megalithic scale that's that's used consistently to to basically space out all of these stones and create these stone circles 
everywhere, all around the British Isles, and it's and it's a system that's derived from like geodetic measurements. Like it's very precisely related to like the dimensions of the Earth. It's it's very sophisticated, and it's consistent across all of these things. So. Yeah, and I think of all the ones, so these are the ones that are remaining in, in the British Isles and Scotland and Ireland and England. But obviously 10,000 years ago, there was it was all connected to the mainland of oh, Europe and there was mm -hmm. Doggerland. Yes. And I'm imagining all the hinges and shit that is just completely under the yeah, sea yeah, now, yeah, the North Sea. Yeah, and do some sonar, figure those out. I'm sure they're down there. Yeah, but, uh, yeah I mean, they can't. They should do so. A few miles that way, so they were bringing them there. But you do get, you do get. I mean, Fifield Down's the main quarry, right? Yeah, Fifield, yeah. Overton Down, Valley of the Stones. Yeah, you do get the kind of sarsens around here a lot. Right. It's like glacial erratics. It's like just right. around. That's where they bought some of the uh, Westwoods as well. Where they, set, where they got some of the stones from Stonehenge from. It's the same, very similar. Now, I was really lucky to catch Maria Wheatley, who is a, a druid specialist. Uh, she knows uh, these sites, these ancient sites, are at the back of her hand, and she was a world of information. This face, I suggest, was completely polished. Can you see bits that still glint? Yeah. Yeah. This is, yeah, in the sunlight, yeah. you can see all the crystal. Yeah. 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 But that, that wasn't polished. That's unpolished. That's polished. And it's smooth. That's Stonehenge. Oh, yeah. So highly polished, the blue stones, they uh, sparkled like the star-spangled sky. The altar stone was green, flexed with garnet and mica. Could you imagine what you see today as a grey temple was the most colourful temple in the British Isles? And interestingly, she has done a lot of research and um, measuring and experiments on measuring the energy levels in and around this particular site. And they, there is measurable, quantifiable um, results that are coming out of this. There are power points, is what she calls them, <laughs> which is the, the ancients could locate where they were and then they placed standing stones around them, that there are ley lines that run through the site of Avebury. And obviously the ancients worked it out and for some reason they wanted their stone circle and their henge to be around the ley line as you can see in many other sites in the world you've got an ancient site there's probably going to be an energy ley line interestingly the ley line measure when you when you when you measure it it came out at seven to ten hertz nasa discovered that astronauts can get quite ill uh, when they get further away from the earth um just the body just gets unhealthy they discovered if they put them in frequency waves of seven to ten hertz it improves their health. And interestingly, 7 to 10 hertz is the measurement of the energy ley lines around Avebury. Imagine now, this stone is rooted into earth energy that could be spiral, it could be circular, it could be a ley line, it could be a grid line, it could be a massive horseshoe shape, yeah? But you put it into that energy, it behaves in a particular manner. It will have five above ground energy bands, and because it's rooted in the chalk bedrock, it has two below. Yeah. So they're like megalithic Now it is ridiculously hard to completely date stone circles because they've been exposed to the elements for thousands of years and you can only really date carbon materials that have been found in and around and on the sites to get like a good thumb idea of, of when when is what. Now something that I was surprised to learn about Stonehenge because it hasn't really been advertised a lot. I found a couple of articles about it but two uh, archaeologists did some excavations way back in 2008 and they found on the site of Stonehenge some carbon material that dated back to 7330 BC. They're not saying that the stones were placed there because that would be a pretty ballsy thing to try and say. But they did say that there clearly was activity, that this site in the world, this henge, was being used 7,000 BC, which is thousands of years earlier than sort of previously allowed, which kind of calls into question all of the stone circles, because obviously uh, before the stones, there was assumably wood henges, and who knows how long they've been there for if they're constantly being replaced and remodeled but the site 
has been used since at least 7330 BC, which is super interesting. Personal hypothesis and feeling about these ancient stones is yes, absolutely, they could be sort of religious temples, ceremonial temples. I have a feeling that these sites were observation centers. The fact that they have all these astronomical alignments clearly meant that people were studying the stars for whatever reason <laughs> they needed to study the stars, whether it be safety, marking comments, marking times. They were they were looking up and they were looking out for sure. And I think that these observatories were there for that reason. But I also think the fact that they are on the ley lines, I think that there definitely could have been some sort of functional property that we are only beginning to tap into in this day and age. We're sort of opening our minds and thinking like, okay, let's let's look at it from all different angles. And I think that the ancients were probably able to tap into natural resources in a way that we could only dream of. Um, I've recently understood and looking into the research about grounding and how wearing plastic shoes is possibly one of the worst things the human beings can do to disconnect us from the earth. And I know it sounds like a whole lot of hippie woo woo. However, I now, whenever I can, whip my shoes off and try and stand barefoot on the ground as much as possible, whether it's in my garden or whether it's out and about in the park, the beach, just literally putting your feet on a beach or putting your feet into the grass, something quantifiable happens within our bodies. And I think that human beings, are, we're supposed to connect with the planet that we are living off and on. So... That's like a smincy little bit of a, an idea of the beginnings of what the ancient people could do. I bet that they could tap into the, re the resources I think this planet probably has for us and held for us in the past. It's exciting. We're, we're, we're tapping into it a little bit now or re-tapping into it. And definitely think that these sites were not just, you know, pretty, pretty ceremonial things. I think that they had a function and I think that they were ob observatories. Thank you so much for watching this video. And it's a little short one. Exciting things coming up. I am heading to the Mecca of ancient sites. Uh, I'm going to Gobekli Tepe. Uh, and Quran Tepe and a lot of other ancient sites in ancient Turkey this October. If you would like to join me, I think we have a couple of seats left. Uh, there's always a bit of a weird scramble uh, before a tour starts. Some people drop out, more people want to join. If you feel called to, that this is the time and this is the year that you need to see this ancient site, you are more than welcome. I will put the link in the description and you can, um, you can come with me because it's going to be a 10 day full on adventure in ancient Turkey and I've never been before. So I'm, I'm going in completely blind. So um, it's going to be amazing. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, happy hunting.